I am a postgraduate student at the Department of History and Archaeology at the University of Nairobi. Today, our speaker is Mr. Alex Mokayombane, and he will speak to us about a topic entitled Condemned at Birth, a narration from children with albinism, uh, 2008 to 2022. Mr. Alex Mokaya is a school teacher in Kenya's basic education system. He owns a Bachelor of Education degree. Currently, Alex is finalizing his MA degree in history and at the Department of History and Archaeology in the University of Nairobi. Alex is also a research fellow at the French Institute for Research in Africa, IFRA. Alex has a broad search interest on the history of philanthropy in Africa, uh, specifically on the role of the Indian minority group in post-colonial Kenya's social development. Uh, Alex, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the stage uh, to help us bring down history from the ivory tower. Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon once more. Uh, it's a, a mixed uh, gathering where I have my seniors, my colleagues, and my friends. I just want to uh, thank you this opportunity to welcome to this presentation, um, which is actually uh, a development from my MA dissert dissertation, which was titled Asian Philanthropy in Medical Services. The case of uh, uh, the case of Nairobi uh, from 1963 to uh, uh, 2002, uh, basically the first two African regimes. The work I'm presenting today is emanates from my MA dissertation, which is yet to be examined, uh, but I've picked it for as an extension uh, based on the data that I was I was collecting as I was developing my uh, dissertation. The work I'm presenting today is still work in progress, is not yet complete. And uh, once it's complete, and then uh, it, will be, uh, it will be good. Um, this paper uh, seeks to, sp uh, to respond to the positive of scholarly literature uh, on persons with albinism uh, in Kenya and their challenges in regard to the provision of social services particularly education and health services. Apart from the misconception and the stigmatization that are associated with the condition of uh, albinism, research is yet to, uh, to be done to identify full range impediments and the encounters that people with albinism are facing. Uh, in Kenya, negativity against persons with, uh, respond with albinism range from security dangers, to gender-based violence, which is pegged on the notion or on the myth that having sex with a, a woman, an albinism woman, will cure AIDS. Beside that, the killing of uh, uh, persons with albinism, harvesting of their body parts, and alongside lack of appropriate medical care, mainly in basic learning institutions, uh, seem to be very common uh, in our country, Kenya. Now, there are several happenings that have taken place in regard to persons with the albinism that have appealed uh, the public interest and public debate on the condition of albinism in Kenya and particularly at uh, children. For instance, in August 2010, Esther Mura, a Kenyan female child with the condition of albinism, was killed by her mother after conspiring with the father that the child is a bad omen to the family. In another case, in August 2012, Nathan Mutei, a Kenyan, was sentenced for 17 years in jail in Tanzania due to human trafficking. Mutei was arrested while attempting to sell a Mr. Wanjala, a Kenyan, a Kenyan from Kitale, who had a condition of albinism. And he was arrested by the undercover police officers who posed to be uh, his clients. 
Citizen Television of Kenya on 24th of September, uh, December 2010 reported on the three-week-old child with the condition of albinism who was killed by the mother. The mother decided to kill the child because of the threats from the father that the child is a ghost and the father had threatened to separate or divorce uh, the, the, lead, the, the mother. These retrogressive uh, myths and beliefs point out that persons with albinism in Kenya are dehumanized, subjected to derogatory name calling, discriminated, and therefore condemned at birth. This study uh, set to investigate the long drawn cultural constructs that remain habitually, that remain and habitually exist in Kenya's socio-cultural space that are incomparable to post-colonial modernity in social development, particularly in education and healthcare and socially ostracized groups, that is the persons with albinism. In view of this understanding, it is therefore critical to arise awareness engineered towards diminishing the influence of retrogressive beliefs and notions that make uh, that uh, that about people living uh, with con uh, with this condition uh, of albinism. It begins by situating the African beliefs and the antagonistic efforts effects on the lives of uh, the people with albinism, and the unique rise of Dr. Uh, Prafa Choksi, Kenya's pioneer ophthalmologist, to the welfare of persons of uh, with albinism amid Kenya's deficiencies in protection of children with the condition of albinism. The chronicles and the experiences of uh, the beneficiaries of Dr. Choksi's foundation that deals with uh, albini albi albinism will contribute to further historical research about histories of the persons with albinism uh, in Kenya. The justification of this paper uh, therefore lays in the teleology of beliefs and the myth of albinism whose retrogressive influence on the lives of persons with albinism uh, deserve a scholarly awareness. Uh, from general observations, it is therefore unmistakable that detriment beliefs, stigmatization, archaic cultural practices contribute uh, to discomfort of uh, persons with albinism and have advisorial effects on their welfare, socially, economically, and even uh, uh, politically. Uh, probably uh, I say some few things uh, on, on my foundations as, as I develop. The rise of um, uh, Dr. Prava Choksi in the welfare of persons with albinism is largely philanthropic. Uh, I met Dr. Him herself while I was collecting data for my, uh, my thesis. And this one is uh, philanthropic based on the social capital, actually uh, to the beneficiaries. Uh, the term philanthropy uh, is derived from the Greek uh, term or word uh, called philanthropia, which means love for humanity. And um, uh, the term, uh, the prefix uh, feel, love it means love or fond of, fond of, while anthropos means humankind or mankind. In this case, I also include womankind, if that one apl applies. Therefore, philanthropy is one and the same with goodness, and will, that is willfully in calculated practices uh, of respect for na respect of nature, hence uh, the love uh, of humanity. On 5th of July, 2022, when I was interviewing uh, the father of uh, pediatric doctors in Kenya, Dr. Mohan Lumba, I was asking him about uh, philanthropy and how Asians respond to philanthropy. Uh, he interestingly, although he's not uh, an, auth an authority in divining the term philanthropy, interestingly, he quoted for me uh, a book by Robert Rai, uh, which he has written, entitled The Gita for the Children, in page 36, and I want to quote it. He say, the book says, the trick, quote unquote, said Krishna, is to do your duty with single-minded focus and great sincerity without worrying about the results of your work. The trick is not to think about whether your work will be successful or a failure, whether it will please anyone or not, whether even whether it will make you happy or because of thinking of results when you should be working with the uh, distraught, you, you, you work for yourself. 
Uh, Mohan Lumba tells me uh, that uh, uh, when one is working with Front Robbie, you do not expect returns. And if you expect returns, then what you're doing is work and you're expecting a salary from it. But now let's go to the scholarly part of it and see uh, the divination of the term philanthropy before I jump into, into the lives of uh, albinism, uh, people with albinism uh, in Kenya. Eric Boyston divines philanthropy as an impulse, a focus on the kind desire to end misery and the suffering of human beings, uh, but that does not offer a right of recipient to a philanthropist. He says that his desire to end uh, misery in terms of human uh, 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 suffering, but again contains that the philanthropy does not uh, uh, give rights of a recipient against uh, a philanthropist. According to Boyston, then, the impulse of philanthropy is spontaneous without any idea of returns, since it contracts formalized practices of, uh, of regularized and legislated uh, kind of giving. So his divination finds well with the quote Dr. Mohan Lumba gave me that a philanthropist does not expect uh, a returns. But yet we are going to see motives of philanthropy, that those who do philanthropy for various reasons, which we shall see uh, later. Now, there is also another scholar called uh, Zoltan, who says philanthropy is also known as a reciprocal relationship that exists between a philanthropist or philanthropists and uh, beneficiaries, where both make an investment that trigger enterprise and opportunity. If you look at what Dr. Prof. Chokes is doing, that we shall look at shortly, uh, is actually uh, triggering enterprise and opportunity and the potential uh, 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 to the children that she is supporting. In the United States or in the United States of America, philanthropy was used by philanthropists to lay the required ground for new cycles of innovation and um, and 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 uh, enterprise. And you realize that in the U.S., majority of the private universities and the good standing universities have come up based uh, or, or based on based on the support through philanthropy. In Kenya and generally in East Africa. Corporate charitable donations are the largest and the long, uh, the strongest practiced by both small and small-scale corporations and the family businesses. I will come to divine later how philanthropy is practiced in Kenya, particularly among Asians. Let me finish with the element of divining what's philanthropy. Now, corporate giving is motivated by the bottom line strategy uh, of public relations, bringing the idea of corporate social responsibility to socioeconomic uh, uh, the socioeconomic development. I will discuss this further in my MA dissertation, which is yet uh, uh, to be examined. Now, human sociability is one of the core attributes of uh, human at uh, core attributes of uh, core attributes of humanity, which explains why some basic needs can only be met with help of others. Uh, through philanthropy, we help others to meet some basic needs, which, according to uh, to my study here is that can only be achieved by the help of others. Even though these needs can be satisfied independently, they are effectively or efficiently realized in a collaboration uh, with others. Now, another scholar, there are two scholars here who have done, uh, uh, who have done, um, who have done, uh, uh, edited a volume that is Brown and Peace. Uh, the names are a bit difficult to pronounce, but I will give you the, the spellings. Uh, they give a different perspective of philanthropy. And they challenge the notion that uh, non-conceptual West, Western civilization, uh, non-conceptual, uh, uh, conceptual non-Western civilization, that is Asia and the rest, lack the culture of uh, of philanthropy. But again, they describe philanthropy as a response to a humanitarian crisis necessitated by generosity and and obligation. Uh, 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 the the issue of persons with albinism in Kenya in my own considered opinion, is a human crisis uh, which has come out and which Dr. Prof. Chokes is responding to uh, based on generosity, obligation, and there are several other motives. Could it be political expediency uh, and many others? But I will come to uh, discuss that as we move forward. Uh, when you read um, Gregory, uh, uh, German philanthropy in transatlantic perspective, uh, perspective, he says that according to, uh, he says that philanthropy is responding 
to humanitarian needs that arise from armed conflict, epidemics, uh, natural and artificial uh, disasters. He explains uh, the motives of philanthropies, where he gives, for example, in Germany, Christians engaged in philanthropy because of religion. Uh, commercial elites practice philanthropy to raise their social status or to, uh, to raise their social capital, while women, according to him, uh, uh, hoped philanthropy will give them opportunities in their civic uh, uh, life. Those are some of the, the literatures I relied on in coming up with a clear divination of the term philanthropy. As I will progress, you will hear uh, what I, I, I will pick. Now, Dr. Prava Choksi, uh, who is the center of my presentation, uh, uh, came up with a foundation that deals with the support of children with albinism. But when I was looking at it, and vis-a-vis -vis the readings I've done from Professor Gregory's work, the, the Rise and Fall of Philanthropy, I realized that the need to preserve and maintain the, te the, the tenets of Asian culture and the interest of colonial government uh, in providing social services uh, to Europeans and Africans constrained Asians to formation of their social uh, institutions for their survival in terms of fulfilling uh, their social needs. One way of achieving this was through philanthropic do donations where individuals, corporate uh, and families contributed, uh, con uh, contributed. Du due to the advantages and the arise of emerging their commercial interests and the growing sense of collective identities, the Asian charitable endeavors began by rise, uh, raising money or funds for construction of social institutions, uh, such as schools, uh, hospitals. And initially, they started uh, establishment of those these social institutions based on ethnicity, religion, and the place of origin. For instance, if you look at hospitals, uh, M. Pisha is for the Hindus. Banda Memorial Hospital in Mombasa is for the for Hindus. Uh, Aga Khan Hospital at the Kocha Ismailis, all the Muslims, and Gurunana Kostro for, for the Sikhs. So their formation of social service, the, the establishment of their social services was actually based on ethnicity, religion, and actually place of origin from their place of origin. In this case, I'll call it colonial India. And I'm using the term colonial India because of the development of 1947 where India became an independent state. At the same time, Pakistan became an independent state. Therefore, the term Indian or India uh, became vague uh, in, in Kenya. So in my contextualized definition of the people I'm talking about, I will be using the term Asian. Now, we need to agree or we need to understand or appreciate the fact that much of uh, Kenya's socioeconomic development took place alongside the construction of the Ugandan uh, railway. The Ugandan railway was actually uh, destined to reach the eastern shores of Lake Victoria, uh, uh, that is Kisumu, by then, which was in Uganda. But it ended up attracting or calling in other culture, other aspects of European culture, such as education, agriculture, and even uh, 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 medical uh, services. Now, through the construction of the Uganda railway, the Asians, or the Indians for that matter, accessed the interior of East Africa through their famous business called the Duka business, which spread beyond remote parts of, uh, remote parts of colonial Kenya. And the rise of Asians uh, in Kenya, in colonial Kenya, came up uh, uh, largely based on commercial, uh, on commercial enterprises, which was meant uh, for their survival, particularly after the 19. 23 Devonshire uh, Declaration. Some of the businesses or the business people or commercial entrepreneurs who thrived during those days, we had one, uh, um, uh, Ibrahim Karimbax, who arrived in Mombasa in 1896. And by 1920, he had uh, several, uh, uh, several uh, uh, about 65 dukas spread uh, across several towns in Kenya. And when I talk of duka, I'm not referring to the Kiswahili word duka, but I'm referring to the, the Hindu word duka, meaning shop. Another one was uh, Megich Betrat Shah, commonly known as M. Pisha, who came to Kenya at the age of 15, 15 years, formed a company, uh, and contributed generously towards the building of hospitals, schools, and colleges, 
till his death on 30th July 1964 in Janak, India. In Janak, India. Uh, I have discussed much about uh, MP Shah and his contributions and actually the development of MP Shah Hospital in my dissertation, uh, which was uh, supervised by Dr. Mbongi and Dr. Msigo. Now, commercial organizations or commercial engagements, eng engagement of Asians in Kenya was either individual or family or a group. And I'm going to explain why they had to go uh, that kind of formation. Example, for example, uh, the Concraft uh, group was one of the commercial groups that began through hawking, evolved into wholesale trading, and finally into manufacturing uh, business. The most famous one, uh, if I can stop there before I proceed to the next one, uh, is the House of Manji group, the House of Manji group uh, of in the 1940s and 1950s, which established the House of Manji, I think dealing uh, uh, with the biscuits. Uh, when I was young, I liked biscuits. I didn't know that this is this was the source. I really liked biscuits. Whenever I've been sent by my mother to go and buy something, I must spare a few coins for the, the that biscuit. So mothers knew how to do it, but fathers, we need to meet behind the tent and look at our engagement with our children, especially when they're young. Now, uh, I, I say, as I said earlier, that Prava Joksi, Dr. Prava Joksi, a pioneer uh, uh, automologist, started what he calls Prava Joksi Albinism Foundation as a charitable organization established in, 19, in 2007, specifically for the aid of children with the condition of albinism. Uh, Jokes, who is uh, the trustee, found, uh, the trustee, the founder trustee, has an experience in ophthalmology for around four year, forty years, four decades, in treating eye conditions. She realized that the need to support children with albinism. She realized the need to support children with albinism in two thousand seven, when she was attending uh, those children uh, at her clinic at Agakan uh, University Hospital. According to her, many of those children who were coming to her clinic according to her, were forced to do their learning or to take their studies in school in, in schools of visual impairment at primary and secondary level, and yet uh, they were not uh, and yet they were not uh, blind, yet they were not blind. So I'm going to, to, to again look at it and, and explain how uh, the children with albinism are not blind, although they have challenges of sight, which can only be collected, collected by photochromatic glasses and if prescribed Earlier. Through her foundation, Dr. Prava Joksi addresses the condition of low vision of children with albinism by examining and providing them with the free prescription of photochromatic, uh, uh, photochromatic glasses, which, according to her, will overcome the challenge of uh, photophobia that affects any person uh, living uh, 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 with, a, with, a, with albinism. Uh, Dr. Joksi tells me that she got interested in albinism in uh, 2007 while examining uh, a child uh, with the condition of albinism in her clinic. The child had been adopted, was adopted by, the child was an adopted that family, uh, the family of Stella. And when they brought the child, uh, the adopting family thought the child is blind. Then they took the child to Dr. Choksi who was shocked to realize that the child was not uh, was not was not uh, was, was not blind dr chuk tells me about 80% of the children she has attended to were studying in schools for the blind yet they were neither blind nor partially uh, blind she says this and i quote her i realized that the situation was really bad mothers could hide the children and could not take them to school those who were lucky to go to school were taking their studies or the learning in schools for the blind. You can imagine uh, somebody who's not blind is mixed or is interacting with the blind. You can imagine how dehumanizing that is. How dehumanizing that is. Now, in, his, in her foundation, Dr. Prof. Choksi has looked at a number of many, pe of many people with the albinism condition who include uh, John, uh, Jonathan Nganga, we have Alex Omunyere. We have uh, the present day government spokesperson and that's Senator Isaac Moura and many others. Uh, Jokes tells me that over 60% uh, over 60 of Kenyan children with albinism are staying with single parents. We are going to explain why 
this single parent is actually, let me correct it, I'm staying with single mothers. I allow me not to use the word parent because when I talk of parent, I include the father. We are going to see how fathers run away when a child has been born and the message to him is delivered that we are we are happy, you have a, a baby bouncing boy uh, with the condition of albinism. That's when men, uh, what we normally call in Luga Yamuta, Uruka Mimba. I don't know how that one, whether it applies here. Over 80% of the children with albinism attend schools for visually impaired. That one I, I, I've, I've actually said. But now the question is, what is albinism? What is this condition called albinism? Perhaps it's not the work of a historian uh, to give a biological definition of the term albinism or explain the biological causes of the condition of albinism. But for the purpose of this, uh, this paper, I've chosen to give the biological definition of the term albinism based on some scholarly materials I've just read from the medical school. I'm not a medic. Albinism, according to Rick, uh, Rick Kittles, albinism is a disorder in which the synthesis of melanin is either reduced or completely absent from the genetic mutations in the human body. The reduction or complete of or absence or, or, or the reduction or complete absence of melanin affects the skin, the hair, and uh, the eyes. Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, the teacher who taught me when I was uh, during my formative years, it was didn't teach me on how to pronounce very well the letters with the H and letters with the A. So you might find me saying air instead of hair and saying hair instead of uh, please, uh, I come from the highlands of Nyanza, where P and and B, T and D uh, is a challenge. But you 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 beg you, you bear with me. Now he types this. He tells me from his reading that there are ten types of albinism, and each different based on biochemical, genetic, and clinical uh, characteristics. Each of these ten types out uh, out of these ten types, eight of them are transmitted through autosomal recessive inheritance where both parents must have the same type of gene for a child to be born with the condition of albinism. Overall, according to Rick, uh, the condition of albinism is categorized into two. The first one is ocular albinism uh, and the other one is ocular tenuous albinism. Uh, ocular albinism is more prevalent in the eyes while ocular tenuous albinism is common with the skin, with the hair, and uh, with, with, the, with the eyes. Albinism is a genetic condition. Now this is what it does. It is a genetic condition and is not caused by any social beliefs or construction. It is a genetic condition that is passed to a child if both parents are carriers of the albinism gene. You can walk normally. Your skin is normal, but you are a carrier. The number of children born uh, with albinism uh, is considerably higher in African countries due to the tropical uh, tropical climate. And that's why in most cases, uh, uh, it is associated with African uh, beliefs as we are going uh, uh, to see it. Now, the condition of albinism and, and its genetic nature is utterly misconstrued. For instance, a child with the condition of albinism in Africa is reflected as a curse to the family, and such children are hunted down as wild animals for benefits, mostly to witchcraft practitioners. I really, I really admire. I wish to meet one who will confess to be a witch. I interview her or him so that I get to know whether uh, that one, how does it go with them? But I doubt whether there are those who could identify clearly. I'm a witch, come and interview me. Uh, according to Doreen Nyakundi, Doreen Nyakundi has done uh, her master's at the Department of his, uh, Linguistics, divines deformities in humanities, says that deformities in humanities is overlooked and in most instances carry uh, some negative connotation, which range from them calling and the association of somebody's ability with the deformity. And even identification, you identify somebody with his deformity. I remember when I was in grade four, by then it was class four. A teacher walked to a class and told me, please go to the staff room and get me a piece of chalk. So I ran very fast from this, from class to the staff room. As I was entering the staff room, I met with the head teacher. And then the head teacher asked me, uh, what do you want? 
that I said have been sent by the teacher to pick um to pick um piece of chalk. Then they just asked me who sent you, which teacher. Then I said the teacher without one eye. In fact, I even demonstrated the teacher without one eye, meaning I will only know the teacher based on what? On the deformity. And actually, others uh, others base the ability of somebody based on the deformity. I do remember in a game of volleyball where my high school was participating, and the ref, the reverie of that game, had involved, was involved in an, an accident, and he had lost one eye. And you know, in the game of volleyball, you stand at the middle, there's this side and the this side. So our school was to decide where, where the eye, which was not there, if I can use that term, to that side. So when the, when he was making his, his judgment as a referee, he made a judgment favoring the opposing team, which was opposing ours. And then we we really said, no, could it be the eye which is on our side is not seeing, it's not seeing clearly. So in some cases, we we relate the ability of somebody with what? The disability. Uh, I don't know whether this is what applies in police. They don't take short people. Uh, I, unfortunately, I'm short. No wonder I didn't make it to police. But I made it to the university. I, I'm here. I made it to the university. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, let me proceed. Let me proceed. Nyakundi argues that this negative representation is frequently perpetuated by those without deformity. It is us without deformity. If that is the condition, if it is us without deformity, who uh, actually deforms Deformity is such as the condition of rebinism and mad with magnitude of misrepresentation, stigma, and contributing to marginalization and vulnerability of persons with the condition. For example, children are often seen as dependents and therefore vulnerable to an unfavorable environment, uh, and they become worse, uh, worsely affected by myth and the beliefs that are associated particularly to the condition of Arabianism. While I was collecting data for this paper, I realized that much of the Arabianism story is associated with witchcraftsy. Therefore, I opted to look for a book uh, written by Middleton, Witchcraftsy and the Sorcery in East Africa, 1963. I didn't know that there are books that talks about witchcraftsy. So if you really want to become one, then there are books to read. Now I learned uh, many. Uh, I learned that many of the challenges facing persons with albinism are associated with witchcraft. From this background, this paper therefore sought to analyze beliefs uh, that about witchcraft in some selected communities and establish how such beliefs, including the understanding of deformities in human beings, are uh, explored. Uh, explore. The first community that I went through uh, about the Nandi. Uh, the Nandi is in the Rift Valley, the North Rift Valley within uh, the Republic of Kenya. The Nandi ethnic community of the Rift Valley believes that men and women within their community have the power to kill or to injure people using the spell. They believe that the people who people should be guard should be guard, should be on guard against quarreling to any stranger, particularly when that stranger is known whether he's a witch or or not. According to the community. The evil of uh, the anything evil for which nobody has a remedy or protection, uh, the answer is afforded by witch finders. To the Nandi, happening such as sudden illness, death are attributed to either ancestral spirits or witchcraft. And when it is found that there is no apparent cause of the apparent cause of such evils, a witch finders are actually called upon. I go to the Nandi community, they prescribe uh, results of spells in four ways. One, illness or deformity. Two is death. Uh, another one is madness. Uh, and they say all this within the powers of a witch. And in the language, the witch is called a pony death. I hope I've pronounced it very well. The Nandi is in the house, you can let me know. It is believed that a witch in, 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 in the Nandi community uh, bewitches people mainly for because of our own reasons. Could it be revenge, greed, or if, or even sheer uh, sheer uh, malice? In most cases, when the victim is, you know, there are sets of uh, spells, the witch simply recites what he or she wishes to happen to the victim. And in most cases, the victim should not be present. Uh, you don't need to be present. 
he only uh, he or she spells out the uh, uh, the spells are always spoken with accompaniments of something that belongs to the victim or close to the victim, such as fingernails, toenails, hair, teeth, a scrap of a cloth, or something else that is associated with you. So please, uh, as you are seated here, make sure you don't leave anything behind because we don't know whether we have witches here. <laughs> I'm not saying that we are witches. Now, the next community that I looked at, uh, the Abagusi, uh, where uh, the speak of today uh, comes from. Uh, now, the supernatural beliefs among the Abagusi people of the former Nyansa province serve the main explanation of troubles. And according to the Abagusi, troubles are called emejando. Uh, Dr. Mbungi, Dr. Nyanchoga, uh, just a sundigi. If, if I make a, a, a wrong uh, interpretation, please come to my rescue. And such image and or such troubles uh, are death, disease, and other natural or artificial disasters, if I can call them artificial. According to the Abagusi, when one is doing very well, when one is doing well, or things within the society seems to be good, then the supernatural spirits or every nature are not involved. The evidence is not there, the supernatural spirits. The other who believe that many of the troubles that are attached to supernatural and the spirits are a chronic illness, death, mental disorder, and the death of livestock called omosando in their, in their community. A witch, Omorogin, according to the other um, is a person with an irredeemable cognizant inclination to kill and they disable others using magic. It's very serious. But now the key is people don't end there. A witch, according to them, can either be can be either sex, male or female. But mass, but much most much more is likely to be a woman. Uh, it can be either, but in most cases, uh, in in more preference, uh, it can be a woman. In the other see, in the other context, the typical witch omorogi is a woman, and the sorcerer, Umunya Musira, is a man. In her nocturnal activity, that is now the witch, and I'm using her because they are associated to witchcraft with women. In her nocturnal um, activities, because they do the activity at night, the Omorogi or the witch knocks at the door at night using her buttocks, and it's believed to run at night naked, carrying fire pots which the Abagusi call Evitono, which burns herbs or grass throughout the night. Witches do not operate alone. That's according to the Abagusi. They do not operate alone. They gather in a particular area late at night, plan to kill or cause misfortunes to their neighbors. It is alleged, and I also quote that way, it is alleged that, it's alleged that they dig out newly buried corpses, divide them among themselves, and eat. Human body parts such as skull, arms are kept as magical parvenalia, which witches use to cause arm or image and all to people. And by the way, if I ask, our department is the Department of History and Archaeology. Do we have archaeological materials of human body parts in our department? Any response from the audience before I proceed? <laughs> Yes. So they were there. Uh, who was in charge of it? That lab, who was in charge? Yes. Who was in charge of, who was specifically from the department, who was in charge? Who was the person responsible for that lab? The caretaker. Okay, let me proceed. So if they're there, I may want to, I may want to see, and on a lighter note, if they're there, then somebody might wonder to, then somebody might believe the reason as to why it's Akisi who is the chair of the Department of History and Archaeology. <laughs> somebody might start associating with that uh, on a lighter note. Uh, generally, according to the East African community, the presence of superhuman powers becomes urgent when bad things occur. Natural calamities such as drought, famine, epidemics, barren women, I don't know why men are not included here, social disorder, Defeat in military war, direct people to humanitarian super to super human causes. And their immediate reaction to discover why those calamities exist is by way 
uh, of uh, is by way of divination. Uh, uh, let's finish with the, the issues of witches and uh, communities. I'm really interested to also interview or get some materials as far as the Luyas are concerned and some communities from the coast so that I can balance the regions before I finalize uh, my paper. Now, myth, regions, and superstition in Africa continues to stigmatize, shun, and discriminate against persons with albinism. In Tanzania, they are hunted and killed as wild animals, while in Somalia, they are pelted with stones and raw eggs, making them to live a dehumanized life full of fear and ridicule. Witchcraft practitioners in Malawi haunt persons with the albinism, believing that their bones and body parts have magical powers of curing terminal illness and bring about riches. Now in Cameroon is serious. In Cameroon, their body parts, such as the hair, the heart, the hair, the fingernails, are believed to be very important in making magical potions for soil fertility and the success in political contestations. No wonder we have uh, unexplained accidents uh, every, every election cycle. I'm not accusing anybody, please. I'm only... Even when scientific explanation is very clear about albinism, it is universal and which is universally accepted, it often lands parallel to existing beliefs of making cultural orientations in Africa. While some myths are, are held continentally uh, and worldwide, others are restricted to particular geographical locations. Among the Kenyan communities, there are general myths that Arabism can still occur as a form of a curse, and in some cases related to marital dismina within the family. I'm going to explain that where if a, a woman gives birth to a, ch a child with Arabism, is told uh, the child is told is the people from your mother who bewitched you. Uh, uh, the others believe that the condition of albinism is as a result of a pregnant woman touching or holding a child with the condition of albinism. Some believe that the birth of a child with albinism is an assumption of infidelity as viewed on a woman by members of her matrimonial uh, of her matrimonial uh, matrimonial home there was one um there's one uh, there was one incident that was aired in bbc uh, this year about somalia now in somalia in mogadishu um elmi elmi bill mohammed a person with albinism was described by the locals as cannibal who might end up eat their children he suffered looking for a rental house in mogadishu and finally uh, got a house with his brother, who was also a, a, a person with albinism. Got uh, got to pay, ended up paying thirty uh, thirty US dollars as rent, uh, as rent, staying in a storage shed. Could not get a house simply because he's, he's a cannibal and he can eat at a people's children. According to the locals, Mohammed and his brother were cast. And could uh, and could even throw a mixture of salt water and raw eggs to their for, to their doorsteps as a form of protection. Mohammed finally got a job as a cleaner in a restaurant in Mogadishu, where he was later fired because a customer stopped eating in fear that Mohammed will eat him or in fear that Mohammed will uh, in, in transmit his disease of albinism to him. That's how humanity has gone. Now in Tanzania, in Tanzania, persons with albinism are called zero zero, uh, a term which Deborah describes as an archaic term that means ghost-like creature because of the skin pigmentation. Evidence suggestion uh, suggests that albino al albino obsession in Tanzania is common within the Waganga circles. What is Waganga in English? Uh, which doctors? On the other hand, the practice of mass killing, mass killing of children with albinism at the birth, this one is Tanzania, is rumored to be the fate of these children. And, they, and later, they report that it was a, a still, uh, a still what? Still birth. Uh, the kid didn't die. They, we didn't kill. Still birth. Through the killing of persons with albinism, though the killing of persons with albinism attracted mass media, uh, media 
and the national community in 2007, the first conviction in Tanzania on the murder of persons with albinism uh, came in September 2009. And this was in connection with the murder of a 13-year-old girl, I'm sorry, boy, who was killed in full view uh, of, his, of his family. The second conviction uh, against a suspect of murder of persons with albinism in Tanzania came in 2008, which involved a 54-year-old man. This victim, the victim brother-in-law, had promised to take him to medical treatment in a distance, a distant hospital. On his way, the victim was attacked at a river crossing, killed, chopped off his head and legs. Shockingly, the victim's brother-in-law was the one charged together with the village elder, close relatives and the people with responsibility, social responsibility in the society. Despite all these uh, con uh, convictions and punishment by death sentence, obsession of Arabianism in Tanzania did not stop. Uh, all these killings were linked to the efforts of miners in the mining zones to secure chance for future, for fortune, not future, for fortune, and protection from danger during mining. It is believed that a tincture which is prepared uh, with the skin of a person of albinism is good, is a good portion for prosperity as commonly believed by, uh, by uh, across Tanzanian mining zones. Locals in these mining zones have a belief that mining activities and its fortune are determined by the unforeseen, uh, uh, foreseen, uh, the unforeseen forces. According to these locals, Mining, I'm going to look along the mining zones. The spirit consists of ancestors, which they call Mizimu, gods, Miungu, witchcraft, Uchawi, and evil spirits, Ushetani, Amamashetani. Fortunes in the discovery of minerals lie within the visibility world. So, this is where the discovery of, of minerals lies with. Uh, Deborah tells me in his in, in, a, in, in a paper. That about fifty persons with uh, about fifty persons with albinism have been killed in Tanzania between were killed in Tanzania between two thousand eight to two thousand nine. Most of these killings were reported along the Sukuma people of northwest Tanzania, one of the largest ethnic group in Tanzania, known for its popular culture, popular culture of witchcraft and beliefs, healing and the divination of uh, of spoils. Among the Kenyan communities, I'm about to finish. Among the Kenyan communities, children born with the condition of albinism are seen as a curse to the family and are not allowed to leave. But any of them, particularly the, but many of them, particularly those who have benefited from Dr. Prof. Choksi's foundation, count themselves lucky to have survived from the danger of being killed as a sign of their families avoiding or running away from curses. At, the, at times, the condition of arabinism in children is used as an excuse for separation uh, uh, among the couples, giving rise to single mother, uh, single mother uh, families. When I was interviewing, interviewing one, one uh, Mary Kamau, Mary Kamau was a nurse at Pumani Hospital, and then later transferred to Babandogo, working in the Nairobi County. Uh, she tells me that when they conduct deliveries, and they realize that a child has a deformity, the mother is given uh, some counseling and he is led through steps to until the mother herself identifies the deformity. And in this case, for my paper, uh, is albinism. And once it has been identified, the next person to reach to be reached to, if exists, because sometimes children can be born without fathers. There are those who have been born without fathers. If they exist, is the father who, uh, who is contacted. According to her, most fathers normally deny they even abandon their wives in Nostro, and the woman is left to struggle with a child with an albinism, a condition that has occurred beyond her, her, her ability. Uh, on uh, a standard newspaper on 14th of August 2003, aired a story about, of uh, Caxton Ozozie, who was born in 1992 in Viga in Western Kenya whose birth became a shock to his parents because of his condition of albinism. His skin was scary, according to parents. His skin was scary and prompted the parents to inquire from the midwives, uh, from the midwives what exactly was happening to their newborn boy. 
the response from the midwives was serious, and I quote this. One of the midwives told them, do not worry. Newborn babies sometimes look like that. Uh, do, not, uh, do not worry. Uh, this is just a normal skin. Sometimes look like that. This was an indication that the midwives were not aware about the condition of arabinism, giving false hopes in Osozi's parents, which is actually not the case. At the end of the day, the boy did not become black as they expected. Instead of welcoming the new family, the newborn uh, family member, uh, his grandmother alleged that the boy was sired by a Muzungu. Actually, one of the name callings that these children go in school is being called Muzungu. So the mother said, no, uh, my son, uh, your wife might have slept with a Muzungu. And go unto you, if Chinese were moving around constructing roads in your village, then you could be told your wife must have gone with one Chinese. And here now we have the product. You can imagine how we have gone. Uh, our, uh, uh, <laughs> and this does not, and actually the grandmother concluded that this does not uh, belong to a family. It was only the mother. It was only the mother who became the greatest support, greatest support system of this boy and protected his, her son from all kinds of stigma when everything, everybody, including the father, had run away. I interviewed some few children, a number of children of, uh, of, uh, who have benefited from Jokes Foundation, although I have not finished the, 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 uh, the process of, of collecting data. Uh, there's one who is called Lois Lehanda, who is now actually the CEO or the operations manager of the foundation, who comes from a family of five girls, and out of the five girls, two have the condition of albinism. She comes from uh, the, uh, the Luya community, where Lois comes from, believes that the condition of albinism is a curse, and the children born with it should not be allowed to live. And they are supposed, uh, and they are always also seen as a curse even to to the community. I really want to interrogate the lawyer culture, uh, especially the Bukusu, and find out how this one is deep into them. But Lois and her sister count themselves lucky to have survived the community curse and at the same time accepted by their both parents. Their condition did not separate their parents. They enjoyed their parental love until when Lois joined Our Lady of Mercy Primary School and Shaurimoyo that's when she realized that she's different from her other children. But that one uh, did not uh, that one did not affect uh, life in school. At primary school, life continued on well until when she was in grade seven, and that is 2009. At school, Lois tells me, I realized I was different from others since I was the only child with albinism at that time. I picked up myself well and used protective uh, wear or gear, uh, mostly a cape and glasses that he got, she got from the, the foundation of, uh, uh, of Dr. Prof. Choksi. The school had a resource center where the children can learn and, it was a, and the life of her life in primary school went on well until 209 in class seven or grade seven, where the class teacher for no apparent reason uh, did not want one to associate with her and could not even give her a chance to explain herself or participate in class discussion. To make matters worse, uh, some of her assignments went undermarked, uh, went without marking, uh, went without marking because the, the teacher associated ability with the condition and because the teacher had known that the child was had a poor eyesight and could not see. And even without that with that condition that the child has poor eyes and could not see, uh, Lois was never allowed to sit closer. It's commonly called blackboard, but nowadays it's called whiteboard and everything. But let me use blackboard, which is most common. So she was not allowed to sit closer to the black or in front of the class where she could clearly see, uh, where she could clearly see uh, what the teacher is writing. Lois tells me she remembers that there was one examination they were given. Uh, which was being administered, and the later children were given awards. When the exam papers was being dished out, the class teacher commented, don't give this one, he cannot make it, based on, uh, on, on, on the condition. That one demoralized her class performance in class seven. 
with con constant but with constant encouragement from our parents and mostly from the father he and he successfully uh, made and by the time i was interviewing her he had graduated with a degree in uh, mass communication and journalism from multimedia uh, multimedia university but again she tells me when uh, i was in class 8 or grade 8 we were given a comprehension assignment in english and the question uh, the, the assignment had six questions but because of my poor eyesight, I answered five. So I missed one. All those who finished, uh, all, all those who did not do the assignment were not punished. But for her, she was punished for missing one uh, question. That's how we can commit. But Lois tells me that I believe in God because he created us and, and has made the reason and has the reason for our, for our condition. I accept myself. And I, uh, regardless, living in a continent dominated uh, by 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 the black people, but again because of support. But before I go to support, let me briefly say something about her life in secondary school. Her life in secondary school was exactly the opposite of her life in primary school. In a second school, um, our lady of mercy. Uh, in second school, yes, our lady of mercy. He was accepted, although he was only. Uh, he was the only child with albinism, well supported, became even a captain, uh, in 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 a captain in sports and a leader in CU, excelled well, and no wonder he ended up in in multimedia uh, uh, university. Another one, the last one that I interviewed, was Sharon Womuyu, who by then was nineteen years, uh, and by that time was still in primary, but says he's lucky to have survived in his village moved to Nairobi, accepted by both parents, accepted by Dr. Prava Joksi, and finally still, by the time I was interviewing her, had finished Form 4, waiting to be admitted uh, 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 to the university. In a nutshell, I don't have in this paper complete findings. I'm sorry, uh, I've not made complete findings because data collection is still, uh, is still on. So once I finish, that's when I will make a complete um, Findings, but preliminarily, uh, the teleology of African beliefs against deformities, particularly the condition of albinism, albinism, is in most cases misconstrued. It does not uh, it does not come from witchcraft or any other condition, but it's a biological outcome uh, where we need to accept the children who are born with albinism, support them, and uh, protect them until when they realize their full potentialities as full human beings. So I am not marketing Dr. Prova Joksi, neither am I marketing Asians, but I'm raising a paper to create awareness of the challenges and difficulties children with albinism are undergoing. And therefore I conclude by saying they are not albinos, but people with albinism. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Banamoka, for such an interesting presentation on a very rare topic in history. Uh, actually, this was my first uh, time to sit in a discussion on about albinism, and I think I have I was able to get some some knowledge. So, some some few observations from the discussion. Uh, it is clear that babies who are born with uh, people who are born with the inherited condition of albinism, which result in reduced melanin pigment in hair, skin, and eyes, are vulnerable in multiple ways in in Africa. That one has emerged very well in the from the discussion. Uh, these children, uh, we have seen that they are potential victims of witchcraft related violence. Uh, which they are targeted for th their body parts for using in lucky charms, which are thought to bring good fortunes uh, in Africa. Uh, we have also seen that they, they face gender-based violence, which are pegged on myths, especially about the intercourse with uh, such people believed to bring cure for diseases like HIV and AIDS. Uh, we have seen also that th these people are socially isolated. Uh, you are forced to attend schools for the blind when you are not blind. 
uh, I think such such things those are some of the the challenges which children with albinism uh, face. So to summarize, uh, this discussion has summarized the scarce research on this topic within integrated and framework of uh, three issues. One, I, uh, one I can talk of otherness. Alex has highlighted the ways in which these children differ from others in the group and how this is perceived by themselves uh, and other people. The other one is watchfulness, uh, and these are the consequences and the impact of this very visible difference on families and communities. And maybe the last one is on agency. Uh, the role which the, the children themselves and other people can do to respond to the ambiguities of, of, of human rights. So in concluding, I can say that the, 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 the limited information on the lives of children with albinism in Africa limits the development of appropri appropriate interventions to support, empower, and mostly important, protect them at this time of danger in the region. So when we continue having the discussions like the one we have, we have and this afternoon, it is a priceless platform for research on which to build and enhance our understanding of the lives of people living with albinism in Sub-Saharan Africa. So that is my takeaway. Uh, Alex, I have some few questions, two questions for you. I want to draw a friendly fire. You are my friend, you have been working along but one question which maybe I need your clarification is, um, what do you mean by witchcraft? You have kept on talking about witchcraft, witchcraft. Are you using the, uh, are you using it from the colonial perspective? Which saw African doctors and surgeons of the time as witch doctors? Because I believe uh, we are here to bring history from the ivory tower. And uh, we have to do that by decolonizing Africans past. So what is witchcraft? Uh, and then the, the other one is about the methodol methodological approach to your, in your data co collections. How do you navigate the ethical issues in your research where I think children are the major research, research subjects? Are you dealing with the children? Because in Kenya, you know, children are people who are below 18 years. And how do you extract the information from those children without arousing feelings of uh, the, the bitter feelings, maybe from previous traumatic experiences? Uh, how do you navigate such? So let me uh, open this discussion by inviting questions from those who are on site for the first round, and then we shall go online for the second one. So questions and discussion is open. We are starting here. Yes, you have the first one goes to my supervisor, Dr. Kenneth Obongi. And then the second one goes to my teacher also, Dr. Gashi. And then we have another one there, maybe the last one. Four will do, and then the other one. So let us go in that order. Yes, Dr. I was thinking perhaps this is a forum for uh, uh, students, uh, Mokaya's colleagues. And, and since nobody was seeming to come up, I thought I needed to. Um, a very fascinating uh, presentation. Uh, uh, Alex, <clears throat> uh, very new uh, theme in, in historical discourse, of course. Uh, it's not every day when historians talk about um, uh, issues of disability. Uh, so I think um, the novelty of the whole thing uh, comes from that, uh, that fact and probably speaks more to the, the theme that we are discussing or we are having the overall theme we are having of uh, uh, bringing history closer to uh, 
uh, uh, to the people and uh, coming down to discuss things that people can associate with in a way. Um, on a light note, uh, I wanted to tell you that all property of uh, the Department of History and Archaeology is vested in the office of uh, the chair. Uh, and uh, this includes uh, uh, quite a few human skeletons that we have, uh, which we use for purposes of uh, uh, archaeological studies. They are all vested under the office of the, the, the chair, regardless of where that chair comes from uh, in, in this country. Um, also, I wanted to mention, at least as a, some kind of disclaimer, that um, uh, uh, Dr. Prabhu Choski, I, I saw her online, is my ophthalmologist. It's, it's, it's a lady who takes care of my eyes. Uh, not every day I can afford her services. And over the years, she's been very kind sometimes to... Uh, give me services without much pay, which I occasionally do not uh, uh, do not have. I thought it is important for me to mention that from uh, from the very very beginning because I I have that uh, that interest. A very kind lady, um, Alex. Um, having said that, I, I have a few questions for you very quickly. One is. Um, you discuss what you are calling Asian philanthropy in, in Kenya. And uh, you seem to suggest that uh, during the colonial era, Asians practiced philanthropy, mainly because of um, uh, what you seem to see as economic and social exclusion of uh, the colonial uh, you know, set up, and they took recourse to philanthropy uh, to replace the colonial state uh, and the social services they were meant to receive from it. I was just wondering, did this, did this situation change uh, in uh, post-colonial Kenya? Uh, if uh, it did, uh, you know, how? And I'm asking this because um, th there is a very interesting interface, particularly in post-colonial Kenya, uh, uh, between um, uh, you know uh, services of the state and post-colonial modernity generally, and the Asian kind of expedient need to identify with their land of domicile, uh, partially because at some point in the immediate post-colonial period, they were almost rendered stateless. And, and they were made to be in a very difficult situation of choosing between either go, going back to India or going to the UK because they were British citizens or remain in Kenya. Uh, does the practice of philanthropy have anything to do with that uh, state of dilemma uh, that the Asians have increasingly found themselves uh, in this uh, in this country, particularly in the post independence uh, in the post colonial period. Uh, now the 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 other one, I I think uh, Fidelis touched on this because uh, your presentation seems to me to revolve around uh, you know culture, body body as in human body, and uh, representation of 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 the same. Uh, what uh, <clears throat> we call in scholarship, you know, othering, uh, where, you know, othering uh, means uh, simply some kind of land social construction of the other uh, as an evil uh, thing against whom both physical and discursive violence sometimes is deemed uh, necessary. I was just wondering, how does this concept inform your, your work? I, I thought uh, he lay, erased it, but I thought you needed to go a bit further and, and tell us how does it inform, uh, inform your work? And uh, finally, uh, have you thought, uh, I mean, this is probably to build on uh, your, your ongoing work, uh, have you 
thought of um, uh, what theoretical approach you would use in understanding some of these aspects that you are uh, discussing. Uh, as you talked, I strongly thought about uh, what we loosely call the humanistic approach uh, to studying social aspects and the humanistic here, uh, because uh, uh, the humanistic approach celebrates, uh, uh, you know, differences and uh, suggests that uh, differences can have a transformative change in seeking solutions uh, uh, to the problems of discrimination, uh, marginalization, and injustices. If, if you can respond to that, I'll be very happy. Thank you very much. Yes, the second one is Dr. Dr. Ashi. Um, thank you very much, uh, Alex. I think that that was uh, a very inf informative uh, discussion. Now, the story sounds a bit grim to me, but I'm of the view that perhaps one of the approach we can take is to balance it out, the grimness of the story with those that have transcended albinism to reach uh, for example, the apex of their careers and society. I'm thinking, for example, of our very own Mumbingugi, the judge of the High Court, who has been very outspoken, actually. Uh, in fact, I was reading uh, an article that uh, in the, I think it's in the standard, uh, called, they call us albinos, the right to kill and mock a fellow human being. Uh, so um, that balance uh, between the sensationalism of, uh, of albinism and demystifying and debunking the myth uh, behind it, I think it's very important if we are going to make uh, to move forward and, uh, and, and perhaps be of service um, here. Um, and perhaps arising out out of that, Alex, you may want to comment uh, because it does appear that the victimhood of albinism, the very harshest of it, is tied to poverty and cultural beliefs vis-a-vis -vis what I've just said about uh, people like Angugi and others who have surmounted the problem. So maybe you'd want to comment on that. Uh, the question, that was a comment. The question really is here, what is the prevalence of albinism in Kenya? Do we have numbers? And question number two, we have societies that uh, specifically um, uh, care or are linked to this. I'm thinking of uh, the Albinism Society of Kenya, I believe instituted in 2006. We also have Albinism Foundation of East Africa. I didn't hear you mention any of the two. Uh, perhaps you'd like to comment on that. And finally, this harvesting of organs seem to have, at least in the past, some international link. Uh, we, we are talking here about dollars. What is the end market on the other side? Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, for your comments and questions. The next one was, yeah. Let's, let's have Mr. Masika, then we can let you there. Uh, thank you very much, Alex, for that uh, presentation. Uh, a quick one. You seem to lean towards Asian perspective from philanthropy and uh, you seem to depict the Asians as the saviors of albinism in your research and the African as the aggressor against albinism in your research. Where is the voice of Asians away from philanthropy? Because the books you quoted most are leaning towards Asians. So do we have the similar problem of albinism in Asian world or they just 
come all over to Africa as saviors of albinos in Africa. Uh, secondly, you seem to depict every African society as uh, uh, an enemy of albinism. And as my senior just said, what is the end on the other side? Because uh, Africans were not harvesting body parts before uh, the, the dollar business. Uh, what is the traditional position of an albino in Africa? Because we have communities that saw them as special human beings, uh, kids with speciality, protected, they will not shave their head, they will not do anything like the Bukusu community where I come from. Uh, such children were seen as special, they will not shave, they will not do anything, work, but they will be there as special and protected. Uh, but but you seem to depict every African society as uh, looking at al an albino as somebody who is uh, uh, who who should who, who is killed who is not allowed to live. So what is the cultural the the traditional cultural aspect on albinism away from the current witchcraft which you are leaning uh, towards Tanzania? Uh, I And when you talked about Tanzania, you reminded me of something that happened a uh, few years ago when a young man lured his friend from Kitale, where I was born and raised, and took them all the way to Mwanza to sell. He was going to sell his friend, who is an albino, and he told him, I'm taking you to a job. Uh, thanks to the Mwanza police that rescued and you saw the outcry all over the country. So what is the cultural? Because we have had, traditionally we had old people from uh, who are with albinism. How did they survive if the community was killing all of them? Or albino is now not uh, in the recent, uh, in the recent. Thank you. Yes, let us have the last one from Let's there so that we can give Alex some time to respond to questions. Okay, thank you to our speaker, Mr. Alex. I'm Puri Tingway, an undergraduate student, and my question is based on the statement that you said 60% of albinism children lives with single mothers. So this statement suggests that there may be lack of understanding among male parents regarding albinism treating it different from other disorders. The concern is that unless efforts are made to educate and foster acceptance among men regarding individuals with albinism, does it pose the possibility in an increase in the number of single mothers raising children with albinism? Thank you. All right, Alex, it is your time to respond to the questions from the audience, welcome. Uh, th thank you. Uh, Dr. I, uh, Dr. Mbongi, I will report Videlis to you as the chair of the department because he likes making my life difficult. He has done it once in IFRA and he's doing it today here. <laughs> we will meet behind the tent and sort it out with the chair of the department on a lighter note. I, I have picked your questions and I've not arranged them in any order. So I will uh, uh, respond to the questions uh, the way I... I, I have picked I picked them. Uh, the first question came from uh, uh, my friend Videlis. Uh, the divination of the term witchcraft. Uh, uh, and was it only tied to Africans? If I didn't get you, uh, if I didn't miss your, your question, was it only tied to Africans? Uh, Middleton, the, the authority that I relied upon, uh, clearly shows that uh, um, witchcraft was worldwide. Actually, I'm looking for a pig a quote I had given to quote it. It was worldwide, but he argues and says that the Europeans were able to 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 transit or to to move away from it uh, quickly as compared to as compared to Africans. Let me see whether I can get the quote. Uh, now this is the quote. Uh, Milton and his uh, co-writer Winter argue that they, uh, there exists a great deal of misunderstanding about witchcraft and sorcery. They posit that beliefs about witchcraft and sorcerers 
have a wide a worldwide distribution and argue that the witches have played a very important role in western society i really don't know what they mean by important i need to investigate further they have really a very important role in western society though europeans no longer hold these ideas instead they regard witchcrafts and witchcrafts and sorcery as superstition and the product of ignorance so from those, that authority uh, witchcrafts uh, was a worldwide affair was a worldwide affair if i can spoil that another question sorry chair the the question that uh, fidel is asked uh, if i understood it correctly is um, how do you qualify mm -hmm. the use of the concept witchcraft as an analytical category away from uh, the colonial connotations of uh, primitivity association with everything African, heathenism, and all that. I think that is the question that he asked. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. Um, witchcraft, as I have said earlier, it has a worldwide distribution. Now, my study is based uh, in, in Kenya, where Africans are dominant, and witchcraft being an element of part and parcel of the social uh, uh, structure, uh, although not accepted, if I can call it like that. But I will look at further on that question, because for now, I seem not to have a clear answer on it. Then Videlis raised a question on methodology, and he talked of ethics in ethical issues when collecting data uh, from children. Uh, maybe I didn't explain this concept. I'm saying I'm using the term children uh, because my my study looks at their lives from primary up to up to pre up to secondary school level. Apart from above from there, I I don't pick it, and that's why I've categorized them as children. That's one. Then two, uh, so far I've not uh, interviewed uh, any any quote unquote child who is below eighteen years. 18 years, but if I intend to do so, because I'm going to move forward to do so, then I'll do so with the permission of the guardian and in presence of the guardian so that uh, the ethical matters are, are, are sorted out. I hope I've made a conclusive statement there. Then uh, the change of Asia in front of me raised by Dr. Mbungi from colonial uh, to post-colonial. Uh, this one takes me back to Yes, on this paper and even uh, my MA dissertation, Asian philanthropy has so far evolved. Uh, in colonial times, it was meant to serve the interest of Asians. It was for their survival. Towards independence, when African rule was almost eminent, they practiced philanthropy for political expediency. Uh, and that continued far uh, throughout the Jomo Kenyatta one regime, even to Moi regime. So far, the Asian front of it has evolved to, from being a political expediency tool, from being a humanitarianism tool, from being from being a religion uh, tool for religion, to a, a tool or, or or a culture which is invented uh, based on the deficiencies and the shortages of the provision of social services in Kenya, particularly medical services, where I have measured I've measured on. So the answer is, yes, it has evolved from what it used to be and to what it is today. And particularly, after the Devonshire paper of 1923, when uh, the, uh, the Europeans gave prominence to Africans in the pretext that Africa belongs to Africans and in the pretext that they were taking Africans to civilization, they abandoned the Asians. And the Asians had to come up with ways of survival. The Asian front of me, if I can comment further, cannot be easily separated between uh, with their Asia, with their commercial transaction. It is from commerce that they accumulate wealth. It is from business that they accumulate uh, wealth. That again is used in reinvesting, uh, reinvesting uh, in terms of philanthropy. Actually, in my abstract of my MA dissertation, I've said is it is an ethnic uh, capital uh, reinvestment of an ethnic uh, capital. Now the Dr. Bongi also raised on the 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 theoretical approach that I may consider in looking at um in looking at uh, uh, this paper. In my own opinion, he was giving a suggestion that I use the humanistic 
approach. Uh, while I was really writing on it, I've not finalized everything. I was looking at the social capital uh, because uh, the foundation that Dr. Prof. Chokes runs is actually to enable these children also transcend what Dr. Gashi was saying, transcend from what we seem to call poverty into some level of social status as others have done. For instance, she quoted uh, the High Court Judge uh, Mumingugi. Now, the next one, uh, the, that was the comment from uh, Dr. Gashi about balance uh, of greenness, of adminism, and transcending that I've made comments. Now, there was a question about poverty, cultural beliefs, uh, being the reason as to why people are against uh, persons with, uh, uh, with, uh, with adminism. Uh, from my study, uh, the, though not yet complete, it is true that poverty and some bit of cultural beliefs, although not all elements of African pre uh, cultural beliefs is, is, is against uh, uh, the, the social nature of humanity, but some end up being against the social nature of humanity. For instance, the, the FGM is uh, one of them, and even Ali Malij is one of them. And in this case, poverty is associated with, uh, with, um, with, uh, with this uh, mis mis mismanagement, with this uh, a discomfort of persons with albinism. Actually, when you look at posters of are they called witch doctors or witch, uh, witch doctor practitioners? I've seen many in Kiswahili, uh, Kupata Kazi, uh, Kuchunga Kazi, Kupata Mali. So they are all tied in poverty. If you go to that gentleman, he will do some gymnastics and they will give you something that will enable you to get money. And once you get money, it means you're transiting. Actually, we associate money and, and, and richness uh, with that. The next one, I... Uh, what is the prevalence, the numbers of uh, uh, the people living with albinism uh, in Kenya? Uh, this one, I have not worked on it. I'm still working on this paper. So I need to look at, at the numbers. I need to look at how they are, they, are, they, they are maintained. But we can clearly see from our cultural uh, orientation, in Kenya, we are very good in producing policies on paper, laws on paper. But again, we become very poor in implementing I can give an example of um, uh, the free primary education, which was introduced in 2003 by the president, the retired president, Mwai Kibaki. Uh, children came to school, but at the end of the day, there were no children. Uh, there were no teachers teaching them. Uh, if I go deeper in history, Mzee Jomo Kenyatta introduced free medical services in all public uh, hospitals. Uh, free services, including inpatient and patient for children, and for adults, it was for outpatient. But after introduction of free medical services, that's when Kenyatta became overstretched. There were no doctors, there were no medicals. Uh, the, the number of patients went up. And to an extent, if you read Dr. Gona's PhD dissertation, to an extent that uh, uh, citizens or ordinary Kenyans were complaining that the free medical scheme is now expensive than the one we used to pay. Because once you pay, at least there was some bit, there was some guarantee of, um, there was some guarantee of, of services. Uh, so I've not looked at that, I'll look at that. Now the question is, the end market, uh, they are being sold, and in most cases, I referred, I, I kept on referring to Tanzania. We really need to, we really need to look at it carefully and understand the relationship between Kenya and Tanzania, especially on social matters and even on political matters. Because even those who fought for what we loosely call uh, second liberation, majority of them when the government was harsh on them, they ran, they ran to Tanzania. I never knew why they didn't go to Ethiopia or Somalia or, 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 or Uganda, but the majority of them went to Tanzania. And again, Tanzania uh, is, is the most communities in Tanzania are still in the traditional ways of, of solving their social problems, which includes uh, which includes uh, witchcrafts, witchcrafts. So my lateness to Tanzania is maybe the proximity to Tanzania and the reach uh, or the fertile business or the fertile markets or the availability of markets uh, in that, uh, in that, in that uh, area. Now, Asians and albinism. This was Mr. Masika. Uh, <laughs> he asked me, uh, are you telling me that there are no uh, albinos, if I can call that term, in Asia? Uh, maybe I didn't mention it. Albinism condition occur in all races. 
it is only more prominent in Africa simply because Africans have a different uh, skin pigmentation uh, than others. Because uh, in albinism condition, it gives you a light skin, brown, if I can use that term. It is very difficult to not to notice it, to notice it in Europe because almost everybody look alike. Difficult to notice in Europe because they look alike. So albinism is all over. That's one. Then number two, I am not talking of Asians from Asia. I am talking about Kenyans of Asian origin. Dr. Prof. Jokes, yes, migrated from India uh, and came to Kenya, but he's a Kenyan, uh, he's a Kenyan citizen, and he's and she's doing what she's doing as a Kenyan citizen. So I'm looking Kenyans of Asian origin within Kenya. The only difference is they they have actually uh, invented a way of seeing um, social problem uh, as an opportunity to invent or to evident their culture of 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 of, of philanthropy. Uh, the disorderliness we have, for example, in the public sector, if I can call that term, uh, the inefficiency we have in the public sector, they have now used that kind of opportunity to invent or, or to make evident their culture of 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 uh, philanthropy. They are not uh, the saviors. They also have uh, their own uh, social problems. Now, African, uh, uh, Mr. Masika also asked me whether I am against Africans. I am not against Africans. I am only looking at the culture, so aspects of African culture that are detrimental uh, to the well-being of humanity. And in this case, I have picked witchcraftsy and other social beliefs in relation to albinism. There could be many. Ali Malik is one of them. Uh, FGM, uh, female genital mutilation is, is another one, and uh, several. But in this particular one, I only picked one and it related it to some aspects of African culture that seem not to do well. And in any case, in Kenya, Af Kenyans of African origin are the majority. And much of the problems we face as a country, either politically or socially or economically, rotates within the, uh, the Africanism, if I can use that term. So they are not the saviors, and uh, I, I am not look. I am not against uh, Africans, but it's only the deficiencies among the African culture that has allowed other people from other civilization to evident their culture on our culture. I hope I'm I'm clear on that. Now, um, I've said this: not all aspects of African culture are bad. Uh, if you look at the way Africans believe in terms of respect to the elderly, in terms of respect to life, in terms of respect to other people's marriages, uh, it's, it's, quite, it's quite good what you, you can admire. The only thing I, 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 could, I could say, true, uh, some aspects of modernity have also triggered poor Africans, if I can use that, Africans from uh, poor social background, to manifest uh, to, or to look for unorthodox ways of survival. For instance, of trafficking children with albinism to areas where it's perceived to be the market where uh, uh, they can be sold. There was a question about um, fathers and children with albinism and whether this is a, fact, a factor uh, that is responsible for the rise of single parenthood, single mothers or single parenthood in, 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 uh, in the country. Now, there are several aspects. One, in most cases, when a child uh, is born, uh, 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 the mother is at the center in giving birth. The information goes to the father. The father becomes the first person to say no, because that could not be my child. The mother might have uh, uh, gone elsewhere for that, for, that, for that matter. But again, there are mothers who again end up killing, <coughs> sorry, who again end up killing children. Others even dump them in the hospital. Mama Naka. If he recovers very well, leaves the kid, the child, the poor child in bed and disappears. Others kill, others sell. I, I picked an episode where when a man threatened to divorce a lady, the lady decided I cannot be alone. So in this case, let me get the, kill the child and save what? Save marriage. Another one, uh, um, the two of them agreed. The mother and the father agreed. Uh, this child is a curse to us. It's a bad woman to the family. And now we have to do what? We have to we have to kill it. Uh, I, I wish I had a book by uh, uh, Lynn Thomas, Politics of the Gump. You will see clearly how, to some extent, women uh, are subjected to the level of only pro reproduction. Uh, but in this case, both men and women are victims 
off uh, live against uh, persons with albinism. But again, uh, mothers, those who appear to be responsible, are the ones who take the birth responsibility. And even the ones the children have interfered, interviewed, and the ones I intend to interview have only been able to reach uh, to the mothers. Uh, fathers, we need to have a meeting and uh, discuss our issues as fathers. Uh, thank you. I will accept the second round of our questions. All right. Thank you, Alex, for your responses. Now, I want us to go online and uh, take questions from the online audience. Anyone who has risen there? Yeah. Any, uh, any question from online? From Daniel. Yeah. Do you have a question from? Thank you so much, Alex. For I think this is a comment. Thank you. Let me read it. Thank you so much, Alex Moka, for highlighting the plight of persons with albinism at the University Forum. Uh, Dr. Cho. Choksi Foundation is indeed indebted to you for this extremely informative and well research paper that will make a difference in the lives of persons living with albinism. I think that is a common appreciation. Well done. Looking for a question. Uh, Daniel, you have mentioned the aspects of parenting, family, and albinism. What is assessment on persons with albinism getting spouses? On Mombi Gogi, she is in a court of appeal judge. Do you get that one, Alex? I, I repeat, you have mentioned the aspects of uh, parenting, stock family, and albinism. What is assessment of on persons with albinism getting spouses? On Mombi Gogi, she is in court of appeal. Uh, do you have any question? I think there is no other questions okay. from online. Let, let me ask a question. Maybe you can get two from one side. Those who are not able, let me speak. Yeah. Dr. And my name is Lois Bosire. If you yes, allow me, I think um, those two online be enough for today. Can I speak? Doctor, you can start. Yes, someone online. Lois Bosire, I think. Let's give an yes. opportunity to her, then she'll come. Uh, good afternoon. I want to thank, uh, thank, uh, thank uh, for, the, for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. I, I work with the with the government, and I just wanted to highlight some issues that I've observed as a civil servant. The government has very good programs that cater for the the people with disability where I believe their albinos belong. Our observation is that uh, we don't get them coming for, to come and consume the opportunities that we've given them. And I don't know what the challenge could be. For example, uh, they don't come for attachments. We have opportunity for attachments. You don't find them applying. We have this program of ACPO. Yeah, whereby we reserve some budget for procurement for for the, for the people with disabilities, for the albinos or another. You find that they actually do not consume that. So I'm just wondering, maybe it's also a chance for that to, to highlight. There could be some, we just wonder, there could be something that is stopping them to come out and consume the opportunities that the government is giving them? Is it because they are not mobile? Is it because of finance? We don't know, we really don't know, but it's, it's a concern. Um, Alex is requesting me to allow Prof. Choksi to speak. I think is online. Yeah. Kindly unmute and maybe speak to us. Uh, 
can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes. You are loud and clear. Yes. Thank you very much, Alex. This was a very wonderful presentation. And uh, I think it will make a lot of difference to the uh, people with albinism. Uh, my way of uh, how I started this foundation and, uh, uh, and I'm helping the people because I feel, you know, charity is also uh, using your knowledge and expertise in changing lives. I think uh, most of the time people focus on the white skin of black, uh, uh, black um, child or black, black parents have a white child without realizing that the real disability is, uh, uh, is related to the eyes. And as an ophthalmologist, I thought I could do something. But uh, not only that, you know, I think uh, how the society and some of the happy patients came forward because this is not work that could not have been done uh, alone by me. Because even if I did check them for free without charging the consultation, you know, they don't even have transport to reach me. So sometimes I have to pay transport for them to, uh, to reach me. Glasses are extremely expensive. Their life depends on these glasses. And each pair of glasses could be about like 5,000 or 6,000 shilling. And we have 3Z Foundation and Mr. Zul Nimdi, again, another person of uh, Asian origin who is here of uh, uh, 3Z Foundation who has been offering to pay for the glasses. So all along, we, if I could just have written the glasses and you see, sometimes we do write uh, uh, prescription we want people to buy but you know we don't see whether actually the person is getting that thing done or not so the whole success of the program has been to be able to give them free consultation free glasses sometimes transport money and now what is the use when i realized that in 2011 that many of the children were being chased away from school because of lack of school fees we have almost 60 to 70% single parent children so i thought what is the use of giving glasses to a child who is not in school and that's how the whole whole journey started and i think you know giving your time using your knowledge and expertise and i think the most important i love the fact that they all call me mom so donation of love and compassion to me is much more than anything I think, you know, we should not treat this as witchcraft. Just treat them like normal children. Just normal. Zero, zero means, of course, people don't want to believe these are human children. I think we just have to treat all children with albinism as, you see, the past has gone. All these witchcraft practitioners and there are many other myths also, you know, that the worst myth that I, that shook the core of my being was to say that uh, all people with albinism are blind and they must study in blind schools. Do you know in 2007, when I started 70 to 80% were in blind school, most of being, uh, them were being taught in Braille. And you know, society goes to that extent that some of the children are still being taught in Braille even in uh, the present time. And so my, actually I will continue my doing my work till the time I get each and every child with albinism out of blind schools. And I think, you know, singly I've managed so far and I hope with uh, uh, Alex paper and, uh, uh, and support from the government, support from everybody else, uh, my dream of seeing every albino child studying in regular schools and I'm sure uh, you know, Goldalin Kakuya Tanga, she had got 455 marks for KCP in 2017. So my other observation is that children with albinism are exceptionally brilliant. Let us give these children a chance. And behind them, behind them, behind them. Uh, for this discussion. So let me see if we have other questions online, maybe. Let's uh, see if we have any other questions. Yeah, yeah. It's like we have another like... one from Daniel Bowen. Thanks so much, Alex, for the nice presentation. You seem to suggest that African societies in Kenya have universal beliefs and practices with regard to the treatment of albinos. If yes, what extent, right? So let us now get the two questions from on site. Let's start with Dr. and then finish with. I can see answer. Alex, you're energetic, you can get some two more, right? So let me add some two more. 
All right. Uh, we have so the two hands raised there. Shall finish by that. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, mine is um, is a simple question, but I also feel that it might be a bit difficult for you. But just try to to answer it. Uh, I'm looking at the, the severity or the level of uh, arpinism because in society, even. Uh, when you move around, in fact, even when I was growing up, there is uh, one man who kind of uh, displayed, uh, you know, characteristics of albinism, but it didn't come out so clearly, such that the skin was not so much light. But uh, for some of us, we were seeing like, uh, you know, this person is, uh, is not uh, totally, you know, black or African, as you say, or is not, again, entirely albino. So in terms of uh, social constructs in society and the philanthropy, where do you classify such people and today perhaps get some help? So do we have a way of uh, uh, measuring the severity of albinism? Or have we ever come across such uh, persons in society? Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Alex. Next one. I think you can guess that. Uh, very much, Alex. Uh, that was an exciting presentation. Um, I also have um, just two little questions. Uh, one is about uh, how you are going to assess the change in this study, because it's a historical study, and uh, history has to do with historical historical change. Uh, for example, when you talk about those beliefs, they seem to be kind of stagnant. How do you show change as you study the whole uh, issue around uh, albinism? Uh, the other one is, um, do we have any, uh, do we have differences between problems faced by people with albinism um, in as far as gender, yeah, uh, you know, men and women are concerned? Are there any differences in um, how society looks at them? Uh, thank you. Yes, let us have two questions. Make them brief so that we can create a chance for, for Malim Wapa. Let, let them ask and then finish by Malim. I feel obliged to give you a chance. All right. Okay, thank, thanks, you, Alex. It's rare. Um, I have so comments. I have seen you, I have heard you. So in the presentation, I have heard you associate witchcraft and puberty, witchcraft and culture. And I have to ask myself, what kind of poverty are you talking about? Because there are different types of poverty. Which poverty are you talking about? Who is poor in the circumstances of a witch and the person who seeks the services of the witch? The next one is culture. And as you explained it, you talked about the Europeans transcending witchcraft. And I thought maybe if you contextualized the circumstances under which the Europeans practiced witchcraft and the Africans practiced witchcraft, then you would have a clearer picture of the role of witchcraft and culture and the issues of uh, what uh, the Europeans then called civilization. I think that would help us to see whether we are talking about 
uh, Europeans transcending it because they were quote and quote civilized, or because there were other technological and economic issues that came by or changes that came by that made them change and that that, that made them uh, therefore move from their traditional beliefs to what then they refer to as civilized. The other one, I, I, I came in a bit late. I might not have grasped everything you said, but I caught you talking about the sighted and those ones who are blind put together in, in, in school. And you, you talked about uh, one of them, one of the, the groups being dehumanized. And I was, and I also had this other uh, term, decolonization, uh, posed as, as one of the cures to these uh, social issues, these cultural uh, challenges that the Africans are, are facing. And I'm wondering, how does one get dehumanized just by associating with the other person? And in the context of inclusive education, how does dehumanization come in? Because when you look at inclusive education in totality, it would require that those ones who are physically or otherwise uh, disabled, I'm not supposed to use that word, but I'll use it in this forum for the circumstances because it has been used, that they should mingle with those ones who are not in any way disabled. That would be total inclusion. So how, how, how would you see it in the context of inclusive education? Thank you. Uh, let, let us have the second last. We have the second last. Yeah. All right. Let us have Molim first then. Uh, uh, Alex, uh, this is among probably some of the topics that <laughs> I've never sat to listen to that kind of a, a seminar of albinism. And I remember when I was growing back in my rural home, we had one boy in my class who had albino. And we would go with the kiwi and apply on his hair so that the hair could be black, so that probably he could be able to look, to look like us. And probably when I look, I, 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 I look <laughs> back. <laughs> this is very funny because we never knew about this, uh, this that this is a, an aspect of disability. So this is probably an observation. When you look at the human rights society in Kenya, I feel that probably it has really glorified the aspect of physical disabilities, maybe people who are, who are, who are using the wheelchairs. To an, extent, uh, to an extent where we look at maybe the aspect of albinism, because quite a number of these people are, are forgotten in our society. Maybe what, uh, Alex, maybe that was just an observation. What I've been able, maybe I, I would ask Alex is, you have said that people who are born with albinism are a curse in a society. A curse in, in which essence? Maybe, are they a bad domain? Do they cause illness? Do they cause death? How are they a curse? And again, Alex, you have said that we are seeing as a result of children being born uh, 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 with albinism, this has increased single parenthood, especially the, the, the increase of single ma mothers in the society. To me, probably this may not be the, the, the case. Because we are seeing as a result of maybe a, a harsh economic a, a, a status in our society, there is increase of women who would like to be dependent financially, who would like to bring their children alone without uh, consulting the men who are the fathers of these children. Again, you find that maybe some men, quite a number of our men in our societies have become irresponsible. And there is no need of living with at least an irresponsible person you go and, and bring up your child alone. Yes, let us have the last one. Please make it brief so that you can give Alex some time to respond. Kindly, make it short. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that uh, uh, promising work, Alex. Uh, my question is, over the years, if you look at uh, generally when the Christianity and Islamism was coming to Kenya, they were using the methods of health, education. Then they bring in religion. 
gathering uh, with the Asians? How come the Asian, their religion is not backing up their philanthropy? And I'm also wondering if uh, their religion could have been going a notch higher or Africans getting into their religion, then their philanthropy could have been a popular roadmap to ending this retrogressive uh, cultural belief. So could it be that uh, their line of thought uh, or their roadmap uh, to ending this retrogressive African or cultural belief, could it be wrong because they are leaving it at some particular point? I'm not seeing Africans going towards Asian religion. I'm not seeing Africans being involved into the Asian education. I'm not seeing Africans being involved into the uh, the healthcare sector, but they generally go to the Christian direction and maybe Islam. So I don't know if that one plays a role. Then could this in quote, in this case albinism, explain the rampant child stealing or other atrocities in this hospital? He mentioned Pumwani. Could it be one of the reasons why we find people stealing children because some are maybe deformed or some are being thrown or dumped in that case and uh, who are the main perpetrators of cultural discrimination uh, or these beliefs in the town setup i've had mwalimu masika mentioning that among the bukusu these people are treated preciously and in a town setup we have different communities so who are these perpetrators? Because the diverse communities have different ways of dealing with such people. Thank you. All right, thank you for the questions, Alex. You have less than five minutes to respond to all those questions. Five minutes. Uh, thank you. Again, as, uh, as I said, I have not arranged these questions. I'm sorry, these answers. I respond to these questions in any order. But before I respond, I want to acknowledge my teachers at the Kikuyu campus, Madam Wenyuike and Madam Ngesa. When I heard their voices, I remembered uh, the main purpose hall at the Kikuyu campus. Madam Ngesa taught uh, me about the Kenya we want. I don't know whether it's the Kenya we wanted then or the Kenya we want now. <laughs> uh, you did a wonderful job. I hope you can assess me and see uh, I'm still a good student. I'm still a good student. Anyway, that's aside. Let me start with um, the first question, uh, which was asked uh, about uh, uh, getting spouses. Uh, getting spouses it still goes back to the cultural beliefs. Uh, the cultural beliefs. Uh, my wife is in this room, but allow me give this example. Uh, one point I wanted. One point I wanted to marry somebody from Kadongo. Uh, you know where Kadongo comes, where Kadongo is. And I come from Nyamira, Bogetutu Masaba in particular. And then when I introduced the name of that girl uh, uh, to my grandfather and mother, uh, the first thing I received is rejection. Because he told me uh, we don't pick from these communities based on their cultural practices and all that. Uh, that was me and a normal, Afri a normal human being without any disability. But for this case, uh, one can decide yes to marry a, a lady with albinism condition. The main challenge you get is the responsibility of the family. And in most cases, uh, they, they, are, they, are, they are rejected. In my study, actually in my study when I was looking at it, it's more worse when you have the condition of albinism and you are a girl. One, there are those who believe that having sex with you will cure their AIDS. So they will come to you as seeking for medicine. I don't know whether they normally get it. They'll come to you seeking for medicine. Then two, if you successfully move and get married, the, your matrimonial family again uh, rejects. So for a girl, uh, actually faces more uh, than a boy. But in most cases, both of both of them uh, face this kind of uh, this kind of challenges. Now the next one was the comments by uh, Lois Posire who said about government services and who said um, 
they are not coming for them. Uh, in my opinion, probably could it was a comment, but I will also make a comment. Probably it will be because of government bureaucracy that exists in our state. I'm, I, I was writing a thesis about Asian frontal medical services, and I went when I went to one of three major public hospitals in Nairobi to collect data. To date, I've never been given an appointment to interview anyone in that hospital in regard to Asian philanthropy in those hospitals. So sometimes uh, government bureaucracies. I went to one, they were told, go and look for the clinical services officer, uh -huh. one see the CEO, one see the publication officer. Uh, to date, I've never gotten any, 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 any appointment for that. So I may say it's because of uh, bureaucracy. Could it be others are not going? And also lack of information. Uh, I have known today that the the children with albinism or people with albinism, they have their special uh, uh, special uh, place or special uh, lot in opportunities. For example, internship and procurement and all that. I've actually, actually had it today. So could it be there's no information coming to that and not that. Now, there was also a question of to what, to what extent African beliefs are affecting uh, the persons with the... Uh, uh, with the person with albinism. I I still need to, to look at it and see how to measure. For now, I may not give a substantive answer because the research is, is still on. But the uh, preliminarily, the extent I can say is that is the negative effect to the, the life of these people, which end up in killing, which end up selling, and then eventually, uh, eventually uh, 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 killing. Now, um, The severity of uh, albinism, uh, uh, Dr. Nyanchoga uh, said it clearly, and he was suspecting whether I would be able to answer the question because it was difficult, and actually the question is difficult. But I need to 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 go back to my source of information, particularly Dr. Prof. Joksi, who will tell me that first of all there are types of albinism. There are up to ten, but again these ten they are classified into two. Now there are those. That uh, there are those that are exhibited, the condition which is exhibited on the hair. There are those that, that are here on the skin. There's the one which existed both the hair, the skin, and the eyes. So we, I, I need some biological understanding on how the severity of this, uh, of this uh, one is. So I, this one I, I, I refer it for further studies about um, about it. My teacher uh, Pamela Langesa asked me uh, the historical change. Witchcrafts of 1920 is still witchcrafts of 1940. Uh, and then how do you show uh, time change? Time change comes in the effects of this uh, the effects of these cultural beliefs to different people in different times. That's why I have picked 2008, a year after the inception of uh, uh, Dr. Prof. Chok's Albinism Foundation, and 2022, by the time I had this, uh, realized of the topic while I was collecting for my thesis. So I will, I will show a historical change based on the effects of the people affected in different in different uh, in different times. And uh, I can also I can also preliminarily say which class has also evolved. Uh, in those days, I used to be uh, witch doctors, witch crafts, which would be or somebody could be uh, witch, bewitched simply because he has many cows or many goods. Nowadays, you will be you can be witched because you have qualified to university. Uh, some people I have seen uh, somebody qualifies for university gets a B minus, a B plus. Uh, by bad luck, the person dies, and then uh, the, 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 all the circumstances is so and so. Who mentioned this, or it happens because of this. So, from that context, I will clear. I will clearly say it has done what it has. It has evolved. People, a person can be with you because you bought a new car, just just a new car. Someone can be with you because you made your hair very well. You went to a a salon and they made a hair different from what he, what he has. So that's what I can say. And then, what kind of poverty? I'm learning today that there are types of poverty. <laughs> the poverty I know is lack of money. <laughs> I don't know whether this that is if I can give it, it is just a casual way of giving it. It's just lack of money. When you don't have money, you're just poor. And poor is poverty. I don't know how we can clear it. But I will have to look at it and look at who is poor in this context. 
and what is poverty because in most cases and in the current uh, contemporary society we be, we tend to look at poverty based on modernity uh, because money goes with the modernity and property materialism uh, we have now changed from owning cows to owning car, cars owning houses and all that so i need actually need to look at these uh, types of poverty and i identified very clearly another question that i need to research further is circumstances under which uh, which crafts under which which crafts was practiced in europe and which crafts was practiced in africa whether the circumstances if i may say this which crafts is which crafts but again we need to look at it i understand the circumstances and then bring out what can be which crafts for the african context and what can be which crafts for for the for the for the european uh, context now i mentioned of dehumanization and a question has come, I think, from my teacher, uh, Madam Wanyoike. Um, when when you get somebody who is blind and somebody who is not blind, and is that not inclusivity? It cannot be inclusivity because one is disadvantaged. The, the, the one who is sighted, who is not blind, is subjected to use the materials and the tools of a blind person. Then that's where dehumanization comes in. If they are together and each and every person is subjected to an environment which best fits his or her condition, then it could be could it be easier. But now, somebody who is not blind he is taken to the school of the blind and he is handled as a blind person, yet he is not blind. Then that could be the element of uh, of dehumanization. Then, uh, uh, it's, it's true that um, human rights have actually glorified uh, physical disability, uh, not necessarily in albinism. I think until after the 2013 elections, based on the 2010 constitution, that's when ODM became the first party to nominate a person under with the condition of albinism to parliament. Uh, that's why Isa Kamora came in. Uh, he actually started from ODM, and you know in Kenya, uh, political parties evolved. He evolved from ODM to, to Jubilee and then he evolved from Jubilee now to UDA. Uh, could it be will be evolving to somebody else, uh, another party? But anyway, uh, uh, it's only that part that came out. But glorification has been given to people with the physical or physical disability. Actually, in my own study, uh, people with albinism are just but normal. The only difference is their skin color. Uh, the skin color now causes the effects of the of the eyes and the effects of the sun to their to their skin. That's where now the difference uh, the difference uh, uh, comes in. Now, I did not say that people with albinism or children with albinism is a curse, but I said some communities or members of the communities consider them as a curse. My study did not find or my study has not made a preliminary finding that children with albinism is just a curse. It is people who peg the tag curse to, this, to these children based on their, on their condition. Now, another thing, I did not say that uh, the issue of albinism is the one which is responsible for single parenthood or single motherhood, because uh, single motherhood in, the, in, this, in this country but could be one of the factors because in most cases we see men running away and leaving the mothers those who are brave to hold they keep on their children alone those who are not brave they kill uh, they, they, they kill uh, they kill the children now uh, somebody has asked a question that i asked an informant when i was collecting my data for my ma uh, the asian religions how comes africans we don't have africans hindus we don't have Africa, africans who are sikh Africans who are uh, who are the the the, the Jains. Uh, what I've realized from Afri from Asian religion is that you are born a Hindu. You are you are if you are, you are born a Hindu. It's not a conversion in Christianity uh, or in other religions where uh, uh, this Masu was uh, a Muslim has now moved to Christianity or he was a Christian has now moved to Muslim. So it's actually secular them. When you read the book of um, Professor Yaswal Gai and Dharam, they have given an, a volume looking at how uh, the, the social setup of Asians has made other Kenyan communities to see them as people who have isolated themselves. It is actually their culture to restrict much of their things to themselves. And actually, when you are a strict adherence of your culture, 
Uh, is that not, uh, can, that, can that be used as a way of not being patriotism? That's their culture. So in this context is that they are restricted to themselves. And as it was in colonial times, even the social services they were providing was for themselves. Uh, was for themselves. But when it was eminent that Africans are rising into power, then political expeditions came in. And, and even after independence, if you remember, during Jomo Kenyatta or Kenyatta one administration, there is no Asian who served in the government past or above the position of permanent secretary, what we call uh, nowadays principal secretaries. The rest were below. I remember uh, the, the former chair of uh, vetting and matches, uh, vetting of judges and matches board, Shara Drao, throughout Jomo Kenyatta regime served as a deputy director of public prosecution. And there was somebody who was the director herself. And when you look at the two, uh, Shara Drao was overqualified to be a deputy, could be actually the prosecutor. Until when Moi took power after, I think, 1982, that's when he was appointed that uh, that position. What Kenyatta did during his time, Jomo Kenyatta did during his time, he only appointed those who were his friends into government positions, not necessarily simply because of their Asian nature, but who were friends, particularly those who even defended him in the Kapenguria, uh, in Kapenguria trials. Uh, lastly, um, the issue of airlifting, how come Africans have not gone for Asian, uh, how come Africans have, gone, have not gone for Asian education? We have many Africans who have been educated in, in India. We have uh, early 90s and late 80s, Many Africans were being airlifted to India. Programs led by, I think, Uginga Udinga, while Tom Boyer was doing it to the US. So that is it. Rampart uh, children stealing, it is not connected to uh, albinism. It is just but another form of social evil that has cropped up in our modern uh, in our modern society. Who promotes these social beliefs and retrogressive cultural activities? Are the committee members themselves? Uh, you can take a man out of the village. But the village cannot be out of uh, the man. Uh, allow me to stop there. Thank you, and may God bless you. Yes, thank you, Alex, for those uh, that interesting presentations. You must say it was very engaging, very attractive, very thought provoking. So uh, let me take this chance to invite uh, Mr. Masika to make one comment. I believe it is burning comment. Uh, thank you. Thank you again. Uh, Mr. Alex, uh, I'll, maybe you might not need to respond to this, but uh, I'm wondering, is it, or you, you need to look at all, uh, the economics of albinism, is it really witchcraft, culture, or the economics? Because I'm wondering, the people who are selling albinos are not old people. They are not the custodians of culture. They are not custodians of witchcraft. Uh, they are young people who live in Nairobi, in urban centers, who do not even profess culture, the culture of those communities. You ask them even which clan do you come from, they don't know. But they are the ones who, uh, who are selling the albinos. So is it really witchcraft? Is it really uh, culture or it is economics? Thank you. Thank you, Masika, for that. And uh, let me now invite uh, our chair uh, to come and uh, give forth of thanks. And before you come, chair, maybe as a request, we need uh, maybe another semester seminar to talk about witchcraft. Be because it's something which is pertinent to our lives as Africans, because it is like witchcraft and Africans are synonyms. But, you know, I've never understood that because I look at an African elder pouring libation uh, in our place, men pour karubu, the, the traditional brew, and women pour milk, fresh milk, uh, and then to appease the ancestral spirits. And then on the other hand, on Sunday during a mass, a Christian priest trying to convert wine into blood of Jesus Christ, and then we cannot tell the difference. Do you have an African witchcraft and then European witchcraft? Uh, these are some things which, if you bring that bait in the village, you might be chased away by the converts. But the Tari, maybe uh, you will, we shall have that forum. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Videlis, for conducting this uh, uh, session very well. And uh, colleagues who are here, 
you can agree with me that uh, we are on our way to our retirement uh, because uh, when our students are taking care of things, we feel that uh, it is time we begin to pack our bags uh, because they will take care of the situation and the department as it were. I, I think a few very quick comments before I settle down to give the vote of thanks. The, the issues we are having with witchcraft, uh, I think in my view, uh, will be sorted out to some extent if we begin to understand how we can use the concept witchcraft uh, as an analytical category in, in academics, uh, minus the labels that have been attached with, uh, to it uh, by uh, the, the colonial mentalities of uh, uh, you know, labeling everything African as heathen, as backward, retrogressive, and all that. Uh, probably that is a debate we need to have at some point. But Alex, I, as you spoke, I thought uh, you, you need to seriously look at the, the book by Luango. Uh, there's a book by Catherine Luango, uh, Witchcraft and Colonial Rule in Kenya, 1900 and 1950. Probably that's a book you need as a beginning point of uh, trying to deconstruct uh, the, the meaning and debunk the meaning of uh, uh, witchcraft. And, and how it can qualify as an academic category that we can use for analysis. Uh, I, I think that is extremely important. And, and, and very quickly, you, you talked about um, uh, Chiramogi Ogingo Ding and airlifts to India. Uh, Chiramogi did more to Russia and uh, Eastern Europe uh, during the ideological uh, Cold War, uh, mainly to Eastern Europe and, and Russia. The airlifts of Kenyan students to India, uh, particularly from uh, the late 50s, early 60s, uh, was mainly organized by the first Indian High Commissioner in Nairobi here, uh, Appa Seib Pant. Uh, and that is partially why at some point uh, the colonial government contemplated of deporting him. And, and they asked the Prime Minister of India, Jawal Nehru, to recall him. Uh, because he seemed to be too close to Africans uh, at the time when he was not meant to be. So uh, that's something probably you need to note. And then uh, on um, the proselytizing credentials of uh, uh, Hindu uh, religions, uh, probably you might want to read my small work that I did many years back on Arya Smach, which is a Hindu social religious uh, movement started in Bombay in 1875. Uh, I think there's still a copy of that in Africana, in our library here, uh, we're entitled Hindu Social Religious Organizations, a case study of, 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 of Arya Samaj. Now, the, the other one, the last one, I find it interesting the way you answered the question on ethical considerations of, of your study. And, and, and probably, uh, 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 Dr. Jokes uh, will guide you on this. Uh, there's something they call in the medical world uh, uh, informed consent uh, with the people that uh, you are interviewing for such a study. Uh, because uh, uh, when it comes probably mentioning people's uh, uh, medical conditions and all that, uh, you might... Um, uh, put yourself into a situation of breaking issues that touch on uh, patient confidentiality and, 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 and all that. So you probably need to relook at that and see how to, to, to handle uh, particularly the information that, uh, that you get. Uh, with that, friends, I now want to take this very last opportunity on behalf of the department and many of my colleagues, some of them who were here earlier and the rest who are here, to thank uh, first, uh, Alex, you, you said your wife is here? Oh, okay, you're, you're lucky, uh, you're a lucky man. Uh, Madam Alex, where are you? Yes, thank, thank you very much for accompanying him. Uh, I can now see where his strength is coming from. Uh, when you have peace, love, and unity in the domestic front, 
you tend to do things much more differently and with passion like you have done. Thank, thank you, madam. Now we can see where the passion uh, uh, of Alex is coming from. Uh, secondly, I just want to thank some of our colleagues, some who are online and on site, very close friends. I saw uh, Hamsuk Divani, good friend of mine, uh, uh, logged in. Uh, I don't know whether he's still in. Uh, I want to thank him very much, a uh, very close friend of mine. And of course, um, uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Braba Joksi. Uh, I owned up here and I said she is my ophthalmologist, a wonderful lady who uh, has taken care of my eyes uh, uh, for some time now. And of course, with very uh, good conditions, he understands that uh, as uh, people in the academy, there's a sense in which we have taken a vow of poverty and we are not very friendly to money uh, and money is not very friendly to us. So Dr. Jokesi, thank you so much uh, for uh, all that you are doing. And we appreciate your support to Alex uh, to undertake this uh, study as, as a department. I also want to thank colleagues uh, from the department. Dr. Gache was here earlier. Uh, Madam Tabita Ndogoto, Masika Ondigi was here, and uh, many others. Many of our MA students who were online, and uh, there was uh, uh, our undergraduate students are coming in quite strongly. There is one of them who is very regular. That gentleman, where are you? The, thanks, man. You, you've been very regular. And this is how you grow as a young academic. And uh, thanks, uh, madam. Uh, you said your name is Christine or who? Uh, Purity. Very well done for under undergraduate students. This is the training ground uh, for you. And uh, as I said last time, our PhD students are not doing very well. And we encourage them to follow the example of our MA students. And, and finally, uh, our presenter for the 7th of December is actually here with us today. Uh, my friend, uh, what I got at the back there. Uh, thank you, sir, for coming in. Uh, you got lost, you came here yesterday. Uh, we normally have this on Thursdays, but I think there was a problem in our entry uh, in our flyer last time. So we will co correct that. Thank you for coming. We are looking forward uh, uh, to your presentation in December, promising quite a bit. Uh, people have asked me uh, what this um, uh, alternative history is. So we are looking forward to it, uh, uh, to listen to you on, on the 7th. I think with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, those online and those on site, thank you very much. God bless, uh, God bless you. See you the next time when we are going to listen to Dr. Nyanchoga talking about archaeology. And uh, Dr. Nyanchoga is here. Uh, he will be the next presenter taking us to the world of archaeology. And Alex, you would understand that we don't keep human skeletons because we are practitioners of witchcraft. We keep them for academic reasons. Thank you, and Dr. Nyanchoa will tell you more about that because he's one of our archaeologists, particularly on heritage conservation. Thank you very much.